everyone. I'm Christy Bagelow, the Director of Statewide Training at Florida Legal Services. Welcome to the webinar. I'm so glad you could join us to celebrate Pride Month with Simone Chris of Southern Legal Counsel. She will be educating us today about the best practices for serving LGBTQ clients. Simone joined Southern Legal Counsel in August of 2016 after graduating from the University of Florida Levin College of Law where she received her JD with honors in May 2016. Chris is the director of the organization's Transgender Identification Initiative, developed by Southern Legal Counsel to fill a gap in access to justice by systemically providing legal name change and identification document amendment assistance to the transgender community statewide. She utilizes policy advocacy impact litigation and community education and training to bring about systemic reform in the areas of LGBT rights, child welfare, implementing trauma-informed services, and special education. So we are so fortunate to have Simone here for the training. And it is without question that she is our statewide expert on LGBTQ issues and name change issues. So thank you so much for doing this, Simone. Thank you for having me. I don't know about expert, but. I appreciate that. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Simone Chris, as she said. I'm the director of our Transgender Rights Initiative here at Southern Legal. Um, for those who don't know, Southern Legal Council is a statewide nonprofit public interest firm. We do impact litigation and policy reform and, and things of that nature. Um, as the director of our Transgender Rights Initiative, I do a lot of um, name and gender marker change work statewide. I've probably worked with many of you at various organizations throughout the state. Um, on that work, I do um, some advocacy with youth who are um, transgender, who are being discriminated against in school to ensure that they have access to the education that they need and deserve. Um, and I do impact litigation around LGBTQ rights. Um, so happy Pride Month. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you for joining us. And we're going to dive in. Um, I, I always like to start um, these presentations with you know, thanking you for being here because it is the first step. Um, we are all on a journey towards cultural competency together. Um, some of us, uh, you know, have been implementing these best practices for a long time and others of us are going to learn terms today that we've never heard before that are brand new. Um, and it's okay if you don't agree with everything I say. It's okay if, uh, you know, you have different opinions or different views or some of this is, is weird or scary or, or different. You're here and I'm excited to start this journey together. Um, so just a quick roadmap of what we're gonna cover today. We're gonna talk about why we all need to be talking about this, particularly right now um, with, with everything that's going on. Um, we're going to do some LGBTQ cultural competency and also touch on intersectionality. Um, we're going to talk about best practices for serving LGBTQ clients. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how you can assist um, your trans and gender nonconforming clients with name and gender marker changes. Um, just to, to let everyone know, this is being recorded. Um, I'm also going to send out a pa the PowerPoint presentation afterwards um, to Christy so that she can circulate it to everyone. Um, and between each section, there's four sections, I'm going to take a quick pause to see if anybody has any questions and I can answer them at that time. But you can feel free to ask questions in the chat um, and, and Christy will be keeping those. So let's dive in. Uh, right now, uh, things are, there's so much going on and what a time for us to be talking about cultural competency and serving vulnerable communities. Um, you know, we, we see the Black Lives Matter um, protests and, and the movement and um, unfortunately the names that are oftentimes left out of the say, say their name chants and viral social media posts and, and the like are the names of the LGBTQ and particularly trans women of color um, who are murdered and who experience um, violence at a, a really disproportionate rate and it's something that we should all be talking about. Um, and in addition to this, you know, we have the, the Section 1557, um, the, the protections for LGBTQ individuals revoked, um, the, the Supreme Court decision uh, that came out, the Bostock opinion that, that held that sex and sex discrimination includes discrimination on the basis of transgender status and sexual orientation. Um, they're, they're looking at rescinding the, the HUD protections that protect LGBTQ individuals right now 
And all of this while, you know, we're at the 50th anniversary of Pride. Um, Pride was born, you know, with everything going on, it's important to remember our history that Pride was born out of resistance and protest. Um, this year marks the 50th anniversary of the first Pride March, which was held the year after the anniversary of the, the Stonewall Uprising in 1969. Um, and it was primarily LGBTQ people of color and particularly trans women of color that were really leading the, the fight and, and the, the riots that led to the LGBTQ um, equality that we have now and led to the, the current LGBTQ rights movement. Um, so, you know, with, with that all as our backdrop, I think I don't need to explain much more why this type of training right now is so important for all of us who are working with these communities. Um, if you don't know what this flag means, this is your first uh, learning moment. Um, we all know the, the gay pride flag with the, the rainbow colors and the inclusion of the black and brown includes our, you know, LGBTQ brothers and sisters of color. Um, and the pink and the blue are for the trans pride flag. Um, so just a little, little tidbit if you didn't know that. So let's talk about the LGBTQ population here in Florida that we all serve. So we have the third highest number of identified trans people and among the highest numbers of LG, LG, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, according to the Williams Institute. Yet we still lack statewide protection for LGBTQ individuals from discrimination in housing, employment, and public accommodations. Um, there's approximately 663,000 LGBT identified adults and over 100,000 youth and uh, over 100,000 trans adults and over 9,000 trans minors. And what's really important to understand is that these numbers are likely a vast underestimation of the true numbers because these are people who were comfortable enough and felt safe enough to disclose the fact that they were trans um, in a study done by the National Center for Trans Equality. Um, and so many people, you know, were probably didn't feel comfortable identifying themselves that way in, in a survey. So um, I, I illuminate this point to say I work with legal aid organizations sometimes who say, you know, we don't really have any trans clients or we don't really have LGBTQ clients. So, you know, it's not really an issue. And the reality is you do. If you think you don't, it's probably because they don't feel comfortable, you know, self-identifying and disclosing. And so hopefully by the end of the day today, we'll all have some tips and tools and best practices so that we can ensure that our um, clients who are LGBTQ feel safe um, in identifying as such. So why is this a legal aid issue? Why do you, uh, you know, those of us that serve indigent populations need to be focused on the LGBTQ community and particularly the trans community. Um, so they are one of the most vulnerable, underrepresented and targeted populations. 90% of trans individuals experience harassment, discrimination and mistreatment at work. Almost 30% of the trans population lives in poverty, which is twice the national average. And the unemployment rate among trans individuals is 15%, which is three times the national rate. And I will say, when I created this presentation, it was before the recent economic um, crisis as a result of COVID. So this number is probably not accurate at the moment. Um, but the point is that, that the intersectionality of poverty is something we need to be thinking about. So only 16% of trans individuals own a home as opposed to 63% of the national average. Um, nearly a third have experienced homelessness and nearly 40% of our LGBTQ youth um, or of our homeless youth identify as LGBTQ. And we know that it's, it's often the case that LGBTQ youth are forced out of or kicked out of their homes, are excluded from schools, um, are, are unable to find affirming foster homes, et cetera. Um, the suicide rate, and this is, um, you know, a statistic that, that I hate even, it's so sad to talk about, but it's so important for us to all know why we need to be affirming in every interaction we have with every human, because you never know um, how someone identifies. But 40% of trans individuals have attempted suicide in their lifetime. That's nine times the national average. Um, you know, I think that if there were anything in our country that we knew if X happened um, or, 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 you know, if, if X situation occurred, uh, this person would have a 40% chance of committing suicide. We would view that as a, a national epidemic, as a, as a public health crisis. Um, and this is the reality with, with trans individuals and 
Um, with youth, 62% uh, of LGBTQ homeless youth have attempted suicide. Um, and then these rates go up for children who are bullied in school or who have been victims of physical and sexual assault. So how do these systems kind of interact in a way that, that leads to all of these really disparate outcomes? Um, so, you know, there's barriers to education, such as dropping out due to discrimination in school and not being affirmed. Um, you know, imagine going through the whole day, having to hold your bladder because you can't, you don't have access to the bathroom that matches your gender identity. Makes it really hard to learn. Um, and so often kids are excluded from the learning environment because of, um, because they're LGBTQ. Um, oftentimes people can't apply for higher education due to having identification documents that don't match their gender identity. Um, and this leads to, various education lead to, uh, you know, individuals being low income. It's difficult to find a job when you haven't had an education. It's difficult to find a job when you don't have identification that, that reflects your true identity. Um, and having low income often leads to um, inadequate or, or no access to health care. And not only is it a resources um, and, and poverty issue, but it's also, um, th there's not a lot of providers out there that are, that are knowledgeable about trans issues, unfortunately. And um, LGBTQ needs are not taught in medical school. They're not part of the curriculum. So we have so many physicians and, and medical professionals that don't understand the health disparities and the unique needs of the LGBTQ community. Um, and then of course, this puts individuals at a risk um, of homelessness and um, temporary housing is often very difficult to find, particularly in sex segregated shelters and things like that. Um, and so all of these systems kind of interact to keep people in a really difficult position. Similarly, how does the criminal justice system interact with individuals? So we know that people of color are profiled um, and we know that trans individuals are profiled. And so when those two forces combine and a person is both a person of color and trans or LGBTQ, um, all, of these, all of these circumstances make it very, very difficult for people um, to just live their lives. So, uh, you know, uh, people who are poor are often profiled or charged with survival crimes, such as sleeping outside, um, panhandling, such as things like that. Um, trans individuals are often uh, criminalized for using the wrong bathroom, for having identification documents that don't match um, who they are. Trans women are often falsely arrested for prostitution when they're just simply existing as a, a trans woman in the world. Um, and then once they are in the justice system, you know, we have a very gendered system and people are put into, you know, incarcerated with people of the, the opposite gender, not, not the gender that they identify with. Um, trans individuals are more likely to be isolated, are more likely to be subject to physical and sexual abuse while in custody. Um, so it's important to understand how all of these systems interact. So I've said a couple times, uh, you know, how inaccurate ID can really um, impact people and lead to discrimination. And if you think about how often we each show our ID, whether it's, you know, Applying for a job, you have to provide a driver's license, getting a drink at the bar, uh, you know, renting a car, anything, any of these situations where we pull our ID out without a second thought as to, you know, this might lead to me being murdered or being denied the, the job. We don't have to think about that. But when your ID does not match the name that you identify with, the gender marker that you identify with, and it's not a picture that represents who you are, um, it's really a scary situation every time you're forced to show that to someone. Um, and so we're going to talk more later about how to help people with updating their name and gender marker, but uh, there's approximately 68,000 individuals in the state of Florida that haven't updated any of their documents. And so they are constantly at risk of discrimination, harassment, and violence. Um, and Florida, as we all know, has a high rate of trans women of color who are murdered. Um, and so, you know, th this is more than just uh, economic stability or something like that. People's lives are at risk when they don't have identification documents that match who they are. So let's talk a little bit about intersectionality and the intersecting systems of oppression, because people can be subjected to multiple forms of discrimination on the basis of distinct aspects of their identity. Um, you know, discrete forms of prejudice like homophobia, transphobia, sexism, classism, racism, xenophobia, they don't act independently of one another. You aren't uh, either black 
or gay. Uh, a person who is black experiences racism, a person who is gay might experience homophobia, and a person who is black and gay will experience both of those things. So it's important to understand how the, they interact. Um, you know, some examples of disproportionality and how these systems interact. Um, African American boys with disabilities face the highest probability of suspension and expulsion um, under zero tolerance school discipline policies. So this is three distinct aspects of their identity interacting, gender, race, and disability. Trans women of color, like I mentioned, are disproportionately likely to be arrested for prostitution for merely existing in public. Low income women of color are more likely to not be believed or protected by the police when they face intimate partner violence and are more likely to actually be criminally prosecuted. Um, and so all of these things intersect. And intersectionality is a really important term that we should all know. Um, so this term, it, it means the complex cumulative ways in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination combine, overlap, or intersect um, with marginalized groups. I'm now realizing this graphic I made is not great. It, it felt like it looked a lot better earlier. <laughs> um, so the term intersectionality was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a lawyer and scholar on critical race theory. She published a paper in 1989 in the University of Chicago Legal Forum titled, Demarginalizing the Intersection of Race and Sex. And she describes it in a really interesting way that um, intersectionality is a lens a prism for seeing the ways in which various forms of inequality operate together and exacerbate each other. Um, and what's important to know is, you know, it, it seems kind of obvious that a white heterosexual man might have an easier life and experience less discrimination than a queer black woman, okay? Um, she has sex, she has race, and she has um, queer, her queer identity, all of those things operating simultaneously. So that's kind of obvious. But what is not always as obvious is that there are hierarchies of um, hierarchies within minority groups. Um, and so the hierarchies of privilege operate even just within the LGBTQ community. Um, and it's important to understand, so like as a white lesbian in the South, who is from a small town, a rural town where, you know, my my town tried to opt out of the human rights ordinance uh, that the county passed to protect LGBTQ people. Um, so my experience as a white lesbian here in the South might be different than a white lesbian in the North who you know, lives somewhere where she's always been protected on the basis of being LGBTQ. But my experience is vastly different than a, you know, a black lesbian in the South or a, uh, a person of color who is transgender in the South. And so, um, you know, it, it, even within minority groups, there are hierarchies. And what's important to understand is, you know, I said earlier, a, a man, a, a black gay man might experience racism and homo homophobia simultaneously, but he almost, he also might experience, um, you know, racism within the LGBTQ community and homophobia within the black community. Um, and so, you know, th these things are important to recognize that these aren't just individual identities that all operate separately. Um, people are experiencing all of these things at once. So pervasive discrimination among the LGBTQ community. The areas in which um, discrimination is pervasive are include access to identi accurate identification, housing, employment, education, healthcare, immigration, family law, prisons and po policing, and public accommodations, among others. Um, and there's inadequate legal protections. Um, unfortunately, there aren't, uh, there's not enough protection for the LGBTQ community. However, as we all know, this incredible opinion came out of the Supreme Court last week, um, the Bostock v. Clayton County, Georgia opinion, which held that discrimination on the basis of a person's transgender status or sexual orientation is discrimination on the basis of sex. And now you know, that, that holding was limited to Title VII, which is employment discrimination. However, as we all know, um, courts, when interpreting other civil rights statutes, often look to Title VII and how it's been interpreted. Um, and so, you know, it's unknown at this point, but I think that the reach of this will be much greater than just um, Title VII. Um, but prior to that ruling, there was no state level protection for sexual orientation and gender identity in 28 out of the 50 states, including Florida. 
Um, so we have a long way to go. And while we're celebrating pride and, and how far we've come with marriage equality and things like that, it, it's great and it's exciting. But unfortunately, the LGBTQ community has not come quite as far. The T has been left behind. Um, transgender individuals uh, have not, you know, necessarily, their rights have not kept up with the LGB movement. And so we need to make sure that we're protecting the rights of everyone within this community. All right, so before I move into cultural competency, Christy, were there any questions from section one? I actually don't know if you can contact me. Okay, perfect. <laughs> yes, you're doing great. Um, just, just a compliment from Amy Burns telling you you're doing excellent, which I concur with. Uh, I don't see any questions yet. Um, hopefully right. everyone can access Q&A and chat boxes, but I am here looking for questions if you have them. All right, we'll keep cooking. Thank you. So, what is cultural competence? It's a set of congruent behaviors, attitudes, practices, and policies that come together in a system or among professionals to enable effective work in cross-cultural situations. So why is this training necessary? Um, cultural competency for lawyers serving LGBTQ clients requires a comprehensive approach, um, which includes understanding terminology, creating a welcoming office climate, and, and being a welcoming individual. So there's, there's different levels, um, you know, having a, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but having a, a just a, a, a flag, a gay pride flag or a trans pride flag or some sort of symbol in your waiting room or in your office that indicates that you are an affirming um, safe place um, it can be really beneficial. But even if that's not the policy of, of your office or you can't do that, little things like I have this rainbow pin, each one of us every single day can make the choice to be more welcoming and affirming to our clients and to the population as a whole. Um, developing appropriate intake and case handling policies, which we'll talk about later. Um, outreach to LGBTQ communities and trusted organizations. Commitment at all levels of the organization, um, from the top to the bottom, every level. And ongoing training and evaluation. And, you know, I, I don't think that anyone on this webinar right now or anyone that works in legal aid or, or any of you um, would ever intentionally engage in discrimination against LGBTQ clients. But oftentimes, um, implicit bias uh, can manifest and uh, by simply not knowing um, ways to, to talk to people, how to ask about pronouns, how to ask about a firm name, um, things like that that we don't even think of as we're being discriminatory those can exclude clients before they even walk in your door. Um, so that's kind of what we're, we're trying to get at here. So first and foremost, we should be culturally competent because we want to be and because it's in the best interest of our clients, but also we're obligated. So the model rules of professional conduct um, explain that competent representation requires the legal skill, knowledge, thoroughness, and preparation for the representation. And that includes cultural competence. Um, another model rule mandating cultural competence is uh, rule 8.4 misconduct. It says it's professional misconduct to engage in conduct the lawyer knows or reasonably should know. And after this training, you all reasonably should know what LGBTQ discrimination looks like um, on the basis of race, sex, religion, national origin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it includes sexual orientation and gender identity. And this includes uh, harmful or physical conduct that manifests bias or prejudice towards others. And I interpret this to mean implicit bias as well. And so we wanna make sure we're checking our own implicit biases that, that all of us have. It's innate, it's, it's natural, um, but becoming aware of them is the first step in, combat in combating them. So what does our duty of competence as attorneys um, to serve all clients require? We have to be able to serve even those clients um, whose communities we don't belong to and therefore might not understand, um, including same-sex families, LGBTQ and gender diverse clients, clients of different races, families experiencing poverty, and clients of various immigration statuses. And again, it can be difficult to understand the needs of and therefore provide competent representation to diverse communities if you're not a part of that community and you lack knowledge. I can't make you Black or gay, or any of those things right now through this webinar or ever. But what I can do is help you 
feel comfortable and confident in the knowledge about these diverse communities so that you can adequately represent them and meet their needs. So cultural competence in 2020, just looking at, uh, you know, demo demographics, racial and gender demographics, what cultural competence requires in 2020 is very different than what cultural competence might have required in 1970 or really at any other time in history because the United States is now home to three, over 350 languages and over 13.3% of the population was born outside the US. Uh, the demographics of the legal profession are not keeping up with the diversifying demographics of the country. So let's look at some of these statistics. In 2009, the numbers of lawyers, the number of non-white lawyers was 12%. It's only increased to 15% in the last 10 years. The number of lawyers who were women in 2019 or in 2009 was 31%. And again, in 10 years, it's only increased 5%. And the number of African American lawyers um, currently is 5%, Hispanic lawyers is 5%, and Asian lawyers is 2%. So this is not representative of the community that we're serving um, and of our client population. So that means it doesn't mean we should get rid of all the white and male lawyers, it means that all of us need to figure out why this is happening, figure out what the barriers are, and figure out how to adequately and competently represent our diversifying, increasingly di diverse um, client population. So in 2019, again, um, this is just highlighting that there are a lot of white lawyers. Okay, terminology. So let's just go through this quickly. Um, I hope most people already understand these things, but so race is the sociological construct used to identify groupings that are presumably biologically and genetically determined. It's a concept defined by anthropologists and sociologists, not by the individual. Um, ethnicity is a common heritage of a particular group, including shared history, language, rituals, music, food, etc. Um, ethnic or cultural identity is part of the individual self-concept derived from knowledge of membership and social groups combined with the value and emotional significance attached to that membership. And what I think is, oh, and it can include these things, what I think is important is to understand that the perspectives of each of us as attorneys are impacted by ethnocentrism, ethnocentrism, which is the tendency to judge all other cultural groups by the standards of one's own group. Um, and so, it, you know, judges, uh, attorneys, everyone is impacted by this. And it's important, again, to acknowledge your own, how your own cultural identity informs how you perceive and interact with others. So before we dive into some of the um, LGBTQ terms and cultural competency, I want to make clear that based on where you are, based on what region of the country you're in, based on what you know, racial group you're from, based on many, many factors. Um, terms are different. So terms that, that some folks use are, are totally, would seem very insensitive to me, but are, are the terms that, that they feel comfortable using. And um, just, just what I'm trying to say is I'm providing the best information that I have based on working very closely with the LGBTQ community and being a member of the LGBTQ community. But what I say is not necessarily right or wrong. Um, others have different understandings and use different terms and such. So um, just keep that in mind. So I like to use the, the gender bred person to discuss the difference between LGB, between sexual orientation and gender identity. So um, we are, over the years, you know, the term LGBTQ has become, it's almost conflated, I think, for some people, that there is a difference between sexual orientation, lesbian, gay, and bisexual, or sexual orientations, which is who you are attracted to, who you um, emotionally, physically, spiritually, et cetera. And transgender um, are, meet, refers to individuals whose sex assigned at birth does not match their gender identity. And they are separate and distinct concepts. Not all trans people are gay. Um, not all gay people are trans, um, but we are, are a community. And, uh, but it's, I use this to, to explain kind of the differences. So let me just dive in. So sex assigned at birth is what's on your birth certificate. It's an M or an F and a doctor looks at, at the baby's genitals and decides based on um, basically just the external genitalia, whether that baby is a boy or a girl. Um, people use the term sex and gender interchangeably, but gender is really a social construct. 
Um, if a baby is born with a penis, we teach him how to be a boy. If a baby is born with a vagina, we teach her how to be a girl. Um, and, you know, a baby doesn't come out inherently liking blue or pink or liking trucks or dolls or any of those stereotypes that the world imposes on children based on the gender that they're assigned. Um, and so I think it's important to understand the difference between sex assigned at birth and, and gender. Um, and so your sex assigned at birth, you know, is, is it, again, the, the sex that the doctor assigned you. That's very different than your gender identity. Your gender identity is, is how you identify, how you view yourself and feel about yourself. And none of you know anyone's gender identity unless they've told you. So none of you on this webinar know my gender identity because I haven't told you yet. But if you were to guess what my gender identity was, and I guess you can only see a limited version of me, usually I'm standing up in the, in the presentation and I can show you that I'm wearing you know, stereotypical women's clothing and earrings and my hair is down. And if you were to guess based on all of those factors that I identify as female and I identify as a woman, you would be making an assumption based on my gender expression. Gender expression is how you demonstrate your gender identity or how you demonstrate who you are. Um, and so gender expression, it's really important for us as, you know, attorneys working with particularly with indigent clients to understand why a person's gender expression might not always be consistent or might not, uh, might not be consistent over time. So let's say that you have a, a client who is a, a trans person who comes in one day and they're presenting their gender expression is female. And then the next time you see them, their gender expression, the way that they're expressing their gender uh, seems more stereotypically male. The reasons why that might be are, are so vast. So the person might have just come from work where if they come out or if they identify or express their gender the way that they, they want to, the way that they feel, um, they might be fired. They may have just come from their home where, you know, if, if they express their gender identity at home, their parents will kick them out. Um, but, you know, maybe they the first time came from school and at school they feel comfortable or, or at a friend's house they feel comfortable uh, expressing the, the gender with which they actually identify. Also, it is expensive and, uh, you know, access to, it requires access to resources to get clothing uh, that matches your gender identity to, you know, have a haircut that might match your gender identity to buy makeup. All of those things require um, a lot of things that we don't, we don't typically think about. So never, you know, assume that you know how a client identifies or, or presume to know something about a client based on um, their gender expression. Um, and so all of these are separate from your sexual orientation. So I will tell you my sex assigned at birth is female. Um, my gender identity is female. My gender expression right now is feminine. However, if you saw me outside of work, it, it would not be. I, I, don't, I don't express my gender the same way outside of work as I do at work. I present more masculinely outside of work. Um, but the point is all of those things, my, my sex assigned at birth, gender identity, and gender expression, what do they tell you about my sexual orientation? Absolutely nothing. Um, so they are separate and distinct concepts. So I'm a gay woman. I am a woman who's attracted to other women, um, but that is totally separate and distinct from my gender identity, how I express myself, how I identify. All right, so sexuality um, is made up of three components, your orientation, your behavior, and your identity. And it's important to understand that just like with, um, you know, trans individuals whose gender expression might not always match up with their gender identity, um, that these three components don't always, you know, maybe match up the way that you might expect them to. Um, and what's important is how people identify. So if someone says, I'm attracted to men and women, I sleep with men and women, but I identify as straight. How do you identify them? This is hard when you guys can't answer my questions. So the answer is you, you identify them as straight. If they call themselves straight, you refer to them as straight because regardless of behavior and orientation and anything like that, we should reflect back at our clients the language that they use. Um, and it's, it's very important to respect an individual's identity. All right, so heterosexual, of course, describes um, individuals who are attracted to members of the opposite sex. Gay is uh, attracted to members of the same gender. 
lesbian is a term for women who are attracted to women, bisexual, men and women. Asexual is little or no attraction um, to, to anyone. Um, and so it's important to just know that there's some stereotypes that even in 2020 are still lingering. Um, when I say a gay man is someone who's attracted to other men, I don't mean every man. Just like how if you're straight and you're a man who likes women, you're not attracted to every woman that you see. Um, you know, so just remembering that if you have a gay client, uh, they're not going to necessarily or automatically be attracted to you by virtue of them being gay. And that's a stereotype that I feel like I shouldn't still have to say, but unfortunately it still comes up um, quite a bit. So other important terms, we should all be allies. So when we say LGBTQIA, um, A, some people refer to it as asexual. Um, that's one thing that A can stand for, but also ally. Um, homophobia, obviously, is the, uh, the, the negative feelings or fear and tolerance towards LGBTQ people. Transphobia, fear of hatred of trans people. And outing, this is something we're gonna get into later when we talk about best practices for in the office, how to protect um, your LGBTQ clients. But outing is the involuntary or unwanted disclosure of another person's sexual orientation, gender identity, um, et cetera. And um, it, it's important to respect that that is not your information to share. Um, that is not information that is owed to you by your client. It's, um, it's very personal and it's something that you know, you have to earn trust and respect for someone to disclose that to you. I do recognize that I just outed myself to an entire webinar full of strangers. Um, however, I feel safe and comfortable doing so. You have to create a situation where your clients feel safe and comfortable and affirmed so that they can, you know, disclose that to you if, if they so choose. But it's not your information to share for others. Okay. So transgender uh, refers to people whose gender identity and sex assigned at birth do not match. Um, this term is an adjective, so please don't say transgendered. The ED implies that something happened to you to make you that way, and that's simply not the case. Um, people are born with the gender identity they're born with, um, and transgenders is incorrect, and I think when you say it, you can hear that it doesn't sound right. So it's an adjective, transgender. Um, TGNC is a common term you might see that's used to de describe the transgender and gender non-conforming community. Um, the term transsexual, my dad keeps using that one despite me asking him not to. And I think that there was a time when um, due to diagnosis, the way that it was codified um, by the APA and such, the word was transsexual. And oftentimes I've seen older individuals who are trans um, still use that word. And if it's a word that they identify with and they use it to describe themselves, that's great. But otherwise, stay away from the word transsexual just because it has some um, negative connotation for a lot of people. Okay, non-binary. Um, individuals who are non-binary um, typically feel that they don't fit into one of the two categories on the gender binary of male and female. Um, oftentimes they use they, them pronouns. If you hear people using those pronouns, um, it, is, it is tricky to get used to using they, the singular they, but I promise you with practice, it becomes very easy. Um, and the more you do it and the more you engage with, you know, an individuals in the non-binary or transgender community, the easier it becomes. Um, so the gender binary is kind of this notion that there's two genders solidly fixed, biologically based, and then attached to them are various stereotypical expectations for behavior, appearance, feelings, etc. Um, so non-binary people um, don't feel that they fit into one of these two boxes that society has told us we have to choose from. Um, there's actually uh, way more individuals these days who identify as non-binary than, than even I realized. Um, the National Center for Trans Equality survey showed that 35% of the 27,000 respondents who were trans that they, um, they surveyed identified as non-binary. Um, and so it's just a good term to know. If someone asks you to, to use they, them pronouns, um, it might mean that, that they identify as non-binary. So gender non-conforming. This is a term used to indicate someone whose biological sex isn't congruent with either their gender identity or their gender expression. And it doesn't mean necessarily that the person is trans and they don't identify with the sex that they were assigned at birth. Um, so for instance, this is a picture of me, the one on the right, obviously, the one on the left is my dad. Um, and for like the first 
13, 14 years of my life, I strictly um, was not gender non-conforming. I did not conform to any of the, you know, stereotypical, uh, stereotypical characteristics assigned to people who identify as female. Um, but again, I'm not transgender. Um, I, I identify as female, but my gender expression does not always match my sex assigned at birth, and therefore um, I might be deemed gender non-conforming. Okay, coming out, and I kind of covered this earlier, but coming out is unfortunately a lifelong process. I just did it. I'm 30 years old. Um, I've been doing it since I was 18, 17. Um, and the most important thing to know, again, is that no one owes you, uh, no one owes you that they, sh that they have to come out to you. Um, and what you do with that information is very important. Um, if it's not relevant to your representation of the client, it shouldn't be a talking point. It shouldn't be uh, the focus of the representation. It shouldn't be something that's discussed in the office unless it's relevant to the representation for some reason. Um, all right, gender dysphoria. So this is a, uh, it's codified in the DSM-5 um, and it refers to the discomfort or distress that's caused by the discrepancy between a person's gender identity and sex assigned at birth. Um, what I really want to nail hammer home is being transgender is not a disorder. It's not called transgender. Gender dysphoria is something that some trans individuals feel um, or experience as a result of the anxiety and stress and psychological um, distress and depression. And some of the things that unfortunately living in a society where the norm is you, you're, you're male or female based on how you're assigned at birth, um, oftentimes those things, anxiety and depression and such, rise to a clinically significant level that, uh, for which treatment is available. Um, but a diagnosis of gender dysphoria is not a license to stigmatize or discriminate. Um, and it's important to know that not all trans people experience gender dysphoria. Um, so there is, a, you know, among trans advocates and a, among the trans community, there are differences in, of, in opinion of whether the DSM should continue codifying gender dysphoria or whether it should be removed in the way that, you know, homosexuality was removed from the DSM in 1973. Um, you know, the difference is that was homosexuality was deemed a mental illness, whereas this is just um, a, a disorder. Um, anyway, the point is uh, some view the diagnosis of gender dysphoria as a, uh, an unjustified, um, inappropriate patholog pathologization of gender variance that's just a normal human condition um, and doesn't need to be pathologized. But the problem is in the US, you, you need a diagnosis to get treatment. And so, you know, I, I'm always trying to help my clients um, who need gender affirming care and who need a doctor's letter supporting um, their diagnosis um, to, you know, obtain a diagnosis of gender dysphoria so that they can have access to the care that they need. But um, no trans person just has to have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria. Um, so it's, it's important to understand how that works. I also just want to quickly mention that um, if any of you do special education um, or, or, you know, represent youth in education proceedings, I have found um, a really useful tool in using Section 504 and the IDEA um, to obtain accommodations and services for trans youth in schools who are being discriminated against that they otherwise would not have access to. Um, so for instance, if a, if a youth um, has a diagnosis of gender dysphoria and, and um, is experiencing debilitating uh, conditions at school due to you know, being discriminated against due to stigma, anxiety, depression, that are keeping them from being able to learn, um, you can utilize the 504 plan in the IEP you can have a, a child qualify for one of those and then use that to get the services and accommodations in place, such as access to the bathrooms that match the youth's gender identity, um, uh, mandating that teachers and, and all staff refer to the child by their affirmed name and pronouns, um, things of that nature. So I just wanted to throw that out there. So I've thrown a lot of terms at you guys and these are more terms. And uh, all of this is to say, the reason I showed this slide is to say, it's okay if you don't understand um, any of these terms or the way, if someone says to you how they identify, it's okay if you don't understand it. It's okay if you haven't memorized the definitions. What's important is that you affirm them and you reflect the language back at them that they use to self-identify 
and, um, and you recognize that it, it's okay, again, not to understand maybe what it means. Um, and no, you don't need to ask what's in their pants. You don't need to ask if they've had a surgery. You don't need to ask who it is that they sleep with. None of those questions are, are relevant to your representation, I can't imagine. Um, what's important is that you affirm the person with how they identify. So um, gender affirmation, sorry, I'm talking so much. Um, gender affirmation is the process where a person begins to live in accordance, um, in a gender role that's in accordance with their gender identity. And sometimes, um, you know, like I said earlier, this can only happen on a part-time basis. If a person is worried they will be fired or kicked out of their foster home or group home or, or from their parents, if they're worried about violence in their community, um, oftentimes they can't necessarily live full-time in accordance with their gender identity. Um, but don't assume anyone's transition goals. Don't assume that, you know, everyone's goal is, uh, you know, we see Caitlyn Jenner on TV, um, someone like that, that, oh, a person must not be done transitioning. They must still be in the process if they don't look the way that you might assume or expect them to look. Everyone's goals are different. Some people want hormone replacement therapy and need hormone replacement therapy and have access to hormone replacement therapy, while others either don't want that, don't need it, or don't have access to it. Um, some people want gender affirming surgeries. Others don't, many don't, um, and that's okay. That doesn't make them any less authentically trans or any less authentically the gender with which they identify. So that's um, important to not assume, oh, they just haven't had, you know, th they're still waiting to get X, Y, Z done. Their transition is their transition. And uh, it, I still have the word transition on here because it's what a lot of people use, but gender affirmation is really a better a better way to say it because the transition is not happening within the person. The person's always been that gender and they're aligning other aspects of their identity, other aspects of their appearance with their gender. The transition that occurs is really how the outside world and how others are perceiving that person. So um, gender affirmation is the more affirming term. So the ins and outs, so like I said, social transition is what is recommended um, by the APA, the American Medical Association, all of the major organizations for youth who um, are not yet of the age where they can have hormone replacement therapy or any of the other treatments. Um, social transition just means living in accordance with your gender identity um, to the extent that you feel safe and are able to. Um, medical transition, again, can include hormone replacement therapy, surgeries, counseling, there's myriad things that that can entail. And then legal transition includes updating one's legal name and gender marker on their identification documents and authentically and legally um, being who they, who they feel they are. Um, and I'm gonna uh, talk later just quickly about how to help individuals with that. It's important to understand why a person that comes into your office might, um, you know, not have any documents or anything that matches their gender identity. Um, and again, we're going to talk about that later, but it, is a, it's an ex, it can be an expensive process. It can be a very emotional process. Um, you need resources. You need to be able to get to and from the courthouse, to and from getting fingerprinting, to and from you know, the doctor to get a letter, um, things that we might take for granted. Um, that there's just a lot of barriers and obstacles in that process. It's important to understand um, Privilege. Uh, we all know what white privilege is. Um, if you don't get woke, everybody should know what white privilege is. Heterosexual privilege um, is for, for individuals who um, are, are identify as heterosexual. Um, there's certain things that, that you are able to do that you might not even recognize your privileges, like being affectionate in public without fear, raising children um, without fear that they'll be discriminated against based on your relationship. Having positive TV role models, you know, that's definitely changing now. I think there's many more LGB people on TV. T, uh, we need to still work on. Um, receiving validation from your religious community, being able to visit your partner in the hospital. Um, and until recently, until 2016, being able to celebrate your marriage and, and give your relationship the title of marriage, which, which has so much meaning and validity behind it. Um, and then similarly, cisgender privileges include 
being able to use the restroom without fear of verbal abuse, physical intimidation, or even arrest, um, using public facilities. Strangers don't assume they can ask you what your genitals look like or how you have sex. Um, and your validity as a human, a man or a woman or a human or however you identify, is not based on how well you pass, which that term is in quotes because I do not like it and I don't think it should be used, but oftentimes uh, how well an individual can assimilate with the gender with which they identify um, is, is, is a factor that, that gives them validity or not. Um, and so these are privileges that we have to, to look at and check. So now we're going to get into actual the nitty gritty of what you all can be doing to best meet the needs of the LGBTQ clients you serve. But I quickly wanted to just pause and ask if anyone had any questions. Simone, we've had lots of compliments so far and also an announcement from Kimberly Rommel Enright. She wanted to let everyone know that the family law section of the Florida Bar is drafting legislation changing the name change statute as well as creating a gender marker change statute to address concerns regarding the transgender community. And they anticipate that it will move forward to the executive council of the section in January. We need to talk. <laughs> After this, Mary, please. That's sorry. I'm just making a note. That's that's incredible. Um, good news. Good news. So when we get to the name and gender marker stuff later, if she wants to to chip in and, and contribute anything about how that might affect the process, that'd be great. Anybody else? I don't see any other questions. Just compliments. Um, if you want to take a short break, because I know you've been talking a lot and giving us all this great information, so let me know if you want to. Great. Okay. I know people uh, probably would, would like this to end a little early, so let's keep going. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, in each of your organizations, um, like I said earlier, whether you know it or not, um, there are, you are probably interacting with lots of LGBTQ individuals. And again, whether they self-disclose those aspects of their identity to you or not um, is is the question of how comfortable they feel and, and many other factors. But the reality is we're probably all serving LGBTQ clients and it's important to know kind of throughout, throughout the entire process of a client's involvement from the first phone call, uh, you know, it might be through a hotline, it might be to your, your secretary at the front desk, um, whomever, from that moment of contact. And actually let's back up, even before they make that phone call, what are they seeing on your website? What could you be doing um, every single step of the process to make people feel more affirmed, um, more supported, more welcome? Because the reality is, and I, I've worked with hundreds of trans individuals who I've helped with name and gender marker changes and other, other types of issues like that. And I, I would be hard pressed to think of one who has not expressed any that they've experienced discrimination from a professional whose job it is to protect that person, whether it's you know, a, a school official when they were younger or an attorney that they sought assistance from and ended up having a horrible experience or a medical provider who they you know, went to for desperately needed medical, medical help and were not treated affirmingly, not treated supportively. Um, and over time, those interactions make it so that individuals fear even trying, even seeking legal help, even seeking medical help, um, et cetera. So it's really important to think through at an organizational level, every single step of the process where you could be doing better um, and could be more welcoming. So um, it's also important to remember that you're, you're collecting very sensitive information, personal information, um, the term dead name, I don't know if I've mentioned this yet, but dead name means the name that a person was, you know, given at birth or the name that they used to, uh, their old legal name. Um, and oftentimes, even just that name being used can be really triggering and really emotionally taxing for individuals. Um, and because we are attorneys, oftentimes we need, you know, legal names, we need pieces of information that are really, really difficult to disclose. So having that knowledge up front ahead of time, um, it can help in the way that we that we interact and bring people in. Um, and also, you likely have staff and volunteers who identify as LGBTQ. And again, whether you know it or not, um, might be a matter of 
how affirming and, and welcoming the environment is, but everything that we're talking about, all the policies and, and practices are just as relevant for your coworkers, your staff, your you know, employees as they are for your clients. So practicing cultural sensitivity. Um, ask questions that are necessary to provide the assistance that, that we need to provide and don't make assumptions. Um, you know, ask the person their, if, if it's necessary, ask the person their legal name, but also ask their affirmed name. Um, please try not to use the word preferred, um, just like how like sexual preference implies like I prefer women when the reality is I, there's no way that I uh, could find myself attracted to a man. Um, it's not a preference, it's just who I am and how I was born. Um, and so same thing, preferred pronouns um, can imply that it's a choice, whereas um, if the person is male, they use he pronouns. Um, and and one, one other thing is, if a person is a, a transgender woman and they identify as a transgender woman, that means they are a woman. And you don't ask, oh, does that mean you went from one, which, we? no. If they identify as a trans woman, they're a woman. If they identify as a trans man, they're a man. And oftentimes we don't need the word trans. If they say they're a woman, they're a woman. If they say they're a man, they're a man. If they say they're non-binary, you get my meaning. Um, so uh, always use the affirm name, even if you have to write down the legal name or have the legal name for a reason, use the affirm name. Um, if it's not clear what pronoun they use, ask them. Um, no one is going to be, well, I shouldn't say no one. Most people are not gonna be offended um, if you ask. If you make the assumption and call them sir or ma'am or, or he or she um, without asking, you know, that could be detrimental and harmful. But if you ask, um, typically people are, are very appreciative of that. And we're gonna get to this slide in a second, but I feel like it, it is easy to say now, or it works now. Um, the way that I do it is number one, um, my pronouns are in my email signature block. So if I've communicated with a client before I actually talk to them or meet them, they see all it says is pronoun, she, her, hers in my signature block. And right there, they know that I'm an affirming person who understands, you know, LGBTQ issues and is sensitive. Um, in person, if I'm, I'm meeting someone um, and I'm not sure, or, or just in general, it's good to ask, I will introduce myself using my pronouns. So I'll say, hi, my name's Simone Chris. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Worst case scenario is the person's gonna say, huh, what are you talking about? And guess what? That's a teaching moment for you to say, oh, actually some people don't use the pronouns that you might assume that they use. So it's good to ask and, and to tell them your pronouns. But if that person is LGBTQ, if that person does use pronouns that um, they might not have been comfortable just upfront sharing with you, or um, they might have had fear about how the interaction was gonna go, you using your pronouns and introducing yourself that way creates such a safe space and it makes such a difference um, with how comfortable the client will feel. So that's a, a, a good tip. Um, and you can ask the person if you need, again, if it's relevant to the representation, what was your sex assigned at birth? And that's an affirming way to ask, um, you know, what, I understand that that's not how you identify, but what's on your birth certificate? Um, but not asking, are you a man or a woman? Not asking, have you had a surgery? Those questions are not appropriate. Um, and then don't assume, you know, I think a lot of us, just naturally will ask, oh, do you have a boyfriend? Do you have a husband to a woman? Do you have a wife? Do you have a girlfriend to a man? Um, you know, gendered, oh, well, where's the father of the kid? You, you have someone sitting there with, with the child. Oh, well, is the father involved? All of those are assumptions that imply heteronormativity and that everyone is cisgender. And so uh, providing space for spouse, partner, parent, those non-gendered terms, um, it's kind of amazing how well we can function without using gender. It's just that like our society is so gendered and everything has, you know, very clear gendered terms. But if you really work on it, you can get to the point where you're saying things like spouse, partner, parent, client, and not gendering every little thing. Um, okay, so this was uh, typically in, in presentations, I will ask people to turn around and introduce themselves to someone using their pronouns. And what I watch is just a sea of awkward because it is awkward at first to you to uh, speak to someone who you assume that they assume your gender and that it's correct. And that is very lucky that you live 
that, that your life is such an, that, that people correctly guess your gender, but not everyone has that privilege. Um, and so the more that we all, um, you know, the more that cisgender allies normalize the, the sharing of pronouns, the, the, it kind of takes the burden off of trans people to constantly have to be having that conversation and explaining things. If we can create a culture where, you know, everyone just uh, uses, introduces themselves with their pronouns and doesn't make assumptions about other people's pronouns, um, it won't be such a heavy lift for the people who it's not abundantly obvious what pronoun they use. Um, a common question I get is, can I just ask people who I'm not sure if they seem androgynous, which means not uh, they, they don't present exclusively male or exclusively female or feminine or masculine. Um, and when we do that, we are making a decision that something about that person means I should ask. And that in and of itself is stigmatizing, particularly if, you know, you have multiple clients in a, in a waiting area or something, and you're only asking one of them what pronoun they use. So getting in the habit of using it um, all the time and not just with people who look like they may be, might be gender variant or gender expansive or, or whatever. Um, it can, it can result in a culture shift within your organization. And I think within our state and within our country towards, um, inclusivity, which is, which is the goal, right? All right. So language, language matters. Um, stopping and thinking is important. So mirroring language, like I said before, reflect the terms a person uses. Um, when I first started doing LGBT rights work and uh, started doing these cultural competency presentations statewide and nationally a few years ago, I would practice them on my parents, um, whatever. <laughs> um, and uh, I remember the first time that I said, you know, who knows what LGBTQ stands for? And I said the word queer. My parents looked at me like I had just I mean, they were horrified and they were like, don't you know, you can't say that? Like queer is a bad word. And it's true that there was a time when the word queer was used as a derogatory term. And, and to some people, it still may be very offensive and derogatory, but youth, particularly youth, but the, it, within the LGBTQ community, people have reclaimed that word. And many of the, the youth that I represent and work with identify as queer. Um, and so it's important to understand that uh, to mirror the language a person uses and to understand that what might be acceptable for one person might not be acceptable for others, etc. Um, my parents got over thinking that I was a totally misogynistic anti-LGBTQ person. Um, so um, also insider language. It's really important to know that uh, if you hear a person use a term that is very clearly derogatory, such as dyke, um, tranny, fag, etc., that does not give you license to use those words. Insider language exists, you know, within all different types of communities, within, you know, different racial communities. There might be a word that, that people can use, but that outsiders, it would be very offensive for them to use. And I think we all know what I'm talking about. Um, so just keep in mind that mirroring language is, is important and it's affirming, uh, but don't use terms that are, are absolutely not appropriate or, or okay for anyone to say outside of the community. Um, if you don't know a person's pronoun, you can use they, their um, as instead of he, she, his, um, et cetera. That's always kind of a safe one because I, I mean, it, I don't know that anybody would be offended if you, if you use the term they. Um, there probably are some straight cisgender people who would be, but um, it's always a safe, safe way to go if you're not sure and you're not comfortable asking. Um, and again, using gender inclusive terms like caller, person, student. Oh, the last time I did this slide was for an education presentation. So youth, student, person are, are bolded, but um, caller, parent, survivor, coworker, et cetera. We don't need everything to be as gendered as it is. Um, and remember that it's okay to make mistakes. I have clients that sometimes I slip up and I'll, I'll say the wrong pronoun or I'll say the wrong name. I try so hard not to, but we all do it sometimes. And it's important to understand like it's okay to make mistakes. This is not um, that it, understanding that some people misgender and dead name people out of animus and bias. And that's why um, you want to try really hard not to do so. But if you make a mistake, apologize, move on, you know, don't make it a big thing. Say, you know, sorry, still getting used to it. Move on, go to the next thing. Um, and remembering that like a person's, name is a fundamental aspect of their identity. So if you 
introduce yourself to me as Christy and we're talking and I keep calling you Jessica. You're going to think she's not really listening. Um, she's not really, you know, uh, we're not connecting. Um, and so when you use someone's dead name, even though it, it may still be their legal name or it might have been the name that you knew them as, um, it's, it's really uh, disrespectful to a fundamental aspect of their identity. All right, intake forms. So all intake forms should give clients um, the option to reveal or omit information regarding their gender identity. Um, this is one of the first impressions that a client gets of your office. You know, uh, I said already, and, and we'll get into this a little more, like having a website that makes it clear that you are an affirming, inclusive provider. Um, having a, a person that answers the phone that doesn't say, yes, sir, if the voice sounds male, and yes, ma'am, if the voice sounds female, um, and doesn't, you know, rely on those stereotypical assumptions. Um, having a, a flag up in your office that, that shows you are LGBTQ inclusive, but intake forms are the first, you know, typically the first uh, document or, or, or whatever that clients interact with. And so you can really set the tone for the whole relationship just with, with the intake forms alone. And I'm happy to send folks um, examples and samples if, if people would like after this, I'm gonna provide my email. But at a minimum, for all clients, you shouldn't have special ones that are just for trans clients, because again, you never know how a client identifies. You should have space for a legal name, a firm name, sex assigned at birth, or a legal gender marker, and pronouns. And um, remove, again, questions that express heteronormativity and assume cisgender, so like husband, wife, um, father, mother. I know on our the Supreme Court um, name change petition forms, that it said when you were changing the name of a minor, it said like father, mother. And you know, it was awkward for my my same sex family clients to have to like scratch out father and write mother number two. Um, so you know, replacing those uh, implicit assumptions about people from your intake forms can set the tone for a much more inclusive, welcoming environment. So again, avoiding gender gendered greetings. Um, you know, we we send out mail to clients often and it you know, it's a formality. We were all taught to write Mr. blah, 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 Mrs. blah, blah, blah. But, you know, that's, again, making an assumption about a person's gender identity. And so um, not answering the phone with sir and ma'am, not sending out mailers that have Mr. and Mrs. Um, and using inclusive language in all communications, not just the ones that are, uh, you know, client outward facing, um, but in how folks talk to each other at the office, uh, the, the policies and the, the practices, it creates a culture. And if you think, okay, I only have to respect LGBTQ people and use these, you know, correct terms and whatever, when I'm talking to a trans client, it's not going to work because it has to be a culture that's within the whole organization. Um, the policy for all staff should obviously be when translate clients seek legal assistance they'll be addressed and referred to on the basis of their self-identified gender using the pronouns and name in use regardless of their appearance surgical history legal name or sex assigned at birth um, and that should be just across the board the policy that everyone knows no matter what level of involvement they have with clients okay creating an affirming office environment um, bathrooms are something that i get questions about all the time and it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be so hard. The reality is uh, that, that people should just be able to obviously use the bathroom that they feel comfortable in. Um, having a actual policy, a, you know, formalizing and having a policy that says that people can use the bathroom that corresponds with their gender identity, not their birth assigned sex is, is best practice. It's possible, like here at Southern Legal, we have two doors, just doors, no bathrooms. No, we have two doors that have nothing on them and they're both bathrooms. And if someone comes in, we say, oh, the two bathrooms are down the hall. So sometimes it's as easy as just removing a plaque that says men's and women's. Um, other times uh, you might not have that ability. It might be a, a, a facility issue where you, you can't do that. And if that's the case, um, what we do inherently is if we see someone that we, our brain tells us is a woman, we say the women's bathroom is on the right. If we see someone that our brain tells us is a man, we say the men's bathroom is on the left. And we're making that decision for them. If you can't ungender your bathrooms, you should always just say the bathrooms are down here. The men's is on the right, the women's is on the left, or 
uh, you know, let's say you have a key to your bathroom, like some places do, you offer both keys. You don't hand them the key based on the gender that you've decided based on your stereotypical notions of maleness and femaleness that they identify with. Um, so it's super simple. These are just small little changes that you can make that can change the whole, the whole environment for LGBTQ people at your office. These are just some signs that I love um, for uh, communicating inclusion in a welcoming environment. All right, what's next? Outreach. So you're not getting LGBTQ clients in your door. Either one, you are and you don't know it. Or two, um, you're not reaching them. Um, and so how can we better uh, reach the LGBTQ clients who we know desperately need our assistance. They are underrepresented. They are much more likely to face um, discrimination and, and have legal issues. So how do we let them know that we're here for them? One good way is participating in legal service referral programs. Um, you know, work with your local, um, your local pride community center, you know, have a, a business card or a flyer or handout, anything that you can put at the local community center so that the LGBTQ people there know that this is a trusted resource. Don't do that though, unless you've done all the other things we talked about and actually created an inclusive and welcoming environment because you do not want to advertise to LGBTQ folks if they are going to come in and, and not experience an affirming and welcoming environment. Um, but work with you know, national organizations and local organizations to uh, make sure that folks know your services are available um, advertise in uh, LGBTQ media. So oftentimes there's like a, like the, the gay Miami Times, or I, I don't know what the names are, but there's lots of LGBTQ, LGBTQ specific publications um, that you can advertise through. Um, and make sure you mention LGBTQ advocacy on your website. So if you absolutely don't do any um, LGBTQ issues, so let's say you don't do name and gender marker change, you don't do uh, you know, anything that I can't even think of anything else that's just specific to LGBT, LGBTQ community. Nevertheless, gay people and trans people have family law issues. Gay people and trans people have uh, housing issues and employment issues and public benefits issues and whatever type of services you provide, there are LGBTQ people who need those services. So it's not like if you put a, you know, a, a gay flag or a trans pride flag or whatever on your website to show inclusivity all of a sudden people are going to be like you're the legal expert in gay stuff you know i'm coming to you for all these issues it's just it it make making sure to include them in the conversation that they're already a part of they're already experiencing these issues um they just need to feel that your organization is a safe place to go for help um so creating a, an affirming office environment again um demonstrating through signage, so having a, a very clear non-discrimination um, statement posted, you know, we, we offer services to all clients and we don't discriminate on the basis of, you know, all, all the things, religion, race, et cetera, et cetera, and make sure to explicitly include sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. Just having those words in your non-discrimination statement can go a really long way. Um, but again, you have to practice what you preach and actually non-discriminate. Um, so signage, um, interactions with clients and coworkers, publications about, you know, things you're doing that involve the LGBTQ community, um, know your rights handout. So oftentimes, uh, legal aid organizations will have like a know your rights housing handout, a know your rights employment handout, a education. Make sure that you include LGBTQ specific issues um, in, those, in those handouts and brochures and stuff. And like I said before, um, Let's say you're at an organization where they're like, no, we're not putting a, a gay flag sticker up in the waiting room, or we're not posting a non-discrimination sign. In your own office, you could have one on your bulletin board. On your own lapel, you could have a little, just something that most people will not even notice or recognize, but for the person who is so afraid to be there, who is so worried that it's gonna be just a negative experience, um, that little tiny like token, that little, little bit of hope can make all the difference for how that interaction is going to go and how comfortable they feel. Um, make your anti-discrimination policy available on your website. Um, again, you might not think it's a big deal, but for the people that are looking for somewhere that they feel safe um, to, to seek assistance, that can make a huge difference. Um, and again, don't just think about this as outward facing. Um, it needs to be 
all of your internal documents, policies, handbooks, everything needs to use inclusive language to create and, and foster an environment of inclusivity. And you know, the focus of this, this is a, a Pride Month training. Um, the focus is you know, more on LGBTQ, but as we talked about earlier with intersectionality, you know, make sure that this inclusive language is encompassing of all, all genders, all religions, all races, all socioeconomic statuses, um, you know, all of those things. Um, the more affirming and inclusive, the better. All right, information sharing within the office. So if the client's sexual orientation or gender identity isn't relevant to the representation, no one needs to know about it. I guarantee you have clients who you haven't asked what gender of person they take to bed because it's not relevant to their housing issue. Um, so if it's not necessary and it's not part of the representation, you know, don't focus on it, don't tokenize. Um, use their firm name and pronoun on all documents, files, case labels, etc. Don't out the client without their permission. Um, avoid casually discussing LGBTQ clients. Um, it's tempting to talk about things that are new and different and, you know, you might think are weird or funny or whatever, but sometimes it's really easy to identify the person that you're talking about, particularly in smaller rural communities, um, etc. And again, don't make their LGBTQ status the focus of the representation. Um, if it is relevant to the representation, create an internal process where the client isn't having to re-out themselves, re-explain themselves, reintroduce their pronouns and name and, and all of that stuff to every single person they work with. So if it is relevant or if the client wants you to and expresses this, um, have a system where like, you know, within the, the, the system online, like legal server or whatever it is, um, you know, everyone knows that the name in legal server or the name in whatever system you use is the client's affirmed name. And their legal name will be used on legal documents when it's necessary or required. Um, but everyone, you know, it's not like every person they interact with, they have to re-explain their whole story because that is exhausting. So the Florida Rules of Professional Conduct, similar to the, the ABA model rules, um, discuss confidentiality, consent is required to reveal information. And um, a person's, I hate saying transgender status, that's not what I, a person's transgender identity is um, protected health information. The fact that they were assigned a certain sex at birth is private and confidential information. Their dead name um, is private confidential information. And you need to understand the gravity that you know, particularly in, in rural communities and, and smaller towns, outing a person um, and disclosing their sex assigned at birth or disclosing their, their dead name can literally put that person at risk of, of death, at risk of violence, harassment, discrimination, et cetera. So there's a lot of implications to um, how you protect this information. Um, so, you know, authorized disclosure, acting competently to preserve confidentiality, those are our, our our duties and our, our ethical obligations. And it's just important to remember how each of these rules translates to LGBTQ clients. Um, so in general practice, again, using, first of all, if a, if a client still has a legal name that's their dead name that they don't identify with, you should be able to help them uh, update their name so that that's no longer an issue um, to, to, to get a little legal name change. And we're gonna talk a little later about the ins and outs of that. But um, if for some reason they're unable to get a legal name change or have not yet, um, you should refer to them as they're using their affirmed name and their affirmed pronouns. You should ensure that the judge is using their pronouns and affirmed name. You should ensure that everyone interacting with them is using the correct names and pronouns. Um, if if uh, the legal name is used um, and then it, you know, changes during the course of the representation or anything like that, you can always use now known as or also known as if there's a reason that the legal name needs to be there. Um, but otherwise, the, the policy should be affirmed name and affirmed pronouns in all in all situations. Um, and confer with your client, let them, you know, have a say and understand like, when I'm about to sit down and do the name change paperwork with clients who I help, before we even open the packet and they look at it, I say, listen, uh, you're gonna have to write your dead name like four or five times just in this petition. I didn't make the forms. I, I wish they didn't require you to put your dead name so many times, but if you'd like for me to write it for you, if it's triggering, I'm happy to do so. 
um, you know, let your client be a part of that decision of, do you want me to, to ask the judge to refer to you using your, um, your affirmed name? Or might you feel even less comfortable if there's, you know, possibly people in the courtroom that you, you aren't out to, or, you know, like let the client be a part of that decision about their own personal private information. Okay, resource referral. So, you know, it's amazing how many organizations don't know where to refer an LGBTQ client for, for, for really anything. So, you know, doing your due diligence and having a list of, okay, these are affirming providers that I know I can send my LGBTQ client to. Um, this is a criminal attorney who's, who's great with LGBTQ issues. This is a housing attorney that, that's affirming and I know will support my client, things like that. Um, knowing medical services to refer, to refer clients to, um, you know, I know the providers in my area who are competent, who I've worked with, who I know will not dead name and misgender my clients, who will provide them the care that they need. Um, again, legal referrals, knowing to refer them to us, to Florida Name Change, the website that we developed that I'll talk about later, um, refer, who to refer them to if they exp experience discrimination. And almost as important, if you know of clients that have had a bad experience somewhere um, and, and it's a non-affirming environment. Make sure that you're not sending other LGBTQ clients there. Make sure that you're aware of both the good places where to definitely recommend and then the bad places where to protect clients from. Staff training. Um, so cultural competency training should cover, you know, all minorities, all marginalized communities that we might be serving. Um, Particularly, I think the, I think the the least amount of information and understanding, oftentimes among lawyers, is around LGBTQ and particularly trans and gender nonconforming clients. Um, so make sure that your staff is equipped to deliver ac accommodating and appropriate and affirming legal services. Um, discuss language. You know, use this presentation. You, you're welcome to the PowerPoint. Um, have training programs where you're you, you know intentionally soliciting LGBTQ affirming materials, um, uh, you know, uh, curate, culminate, whatever, uh, uh, a resource bank of, oh, you have a, a new client who's LGBTQ and you don't quite, you, you're nervous about how to interact. Here's some resources that we've developed or that we've acquired um, on, on how to best interact with people. Um, make sure that you are equipping your staff with everything they need to be affirming. Um, and again, even if you don't think you have any uh, trans employees or clients or any LGBTQ individuals that you're interacting with, it's important to have all of this in place because you never know, tomorrow might be the day that you get your, your first trans client if you're the only organization in the state that's never worked with a trans person. Um, so having all of this in place and having everyone trained. Um, again, the Florida rules, like the model rules, uh, make these things uh, mandatory. Um, and we do have uh, ethical obligations as attorneys that we that are very easy to understand in other contexts, but oftentimes it's um, it's not quite as clear cut as how they apply to working with LGBTQ and other vulnerable minorities. Um, again, don't don't it's it's easy to ask questions beyond what you actually need for the representation um especially when it's you know someone's willing and seems like oh yeah i'll tell you about you know when i when i realized that my gender identity didn't match my sex assigned at birth when i realized i was attracted to men or women when i you know it, just because a client is willing to answer your questions, it's really important to be aware of your power because oftentimes as lawyers, if we ask a question, the client assumes they have to answer it. They assume it's necessary for them to answer it and oftentimes think, you know, if they answer incorrectly or answer dishonestly or anything of that nature that, um, you know, it might affect their representation, it's the law, it's scary. Um, so be aware of your power and don't ask probing questions that are just stemming from your curiosity because that client might go home later and feel really vulnerable and exposed and wonder why did I disclose all of that? Why did they ask all of that? So just be, be careful with that because oftentimes we don't recognize the power that we have when we're asking questions. Um, again, everything that we've talked about applies with equal force to employees and staff. Um, have an action plan now for a, a transition gender affirmation plan. 
um, you know, how are you going to address it? Are you going to reprint? When are you going to reprint the business cards with the affirmed name and the new legal name? When are you going to, you know, discuss with the rest of the staff? We're now referring to, you know, this person as blank. Um, we're using he, him, or she, her pronouns. Um, make sure the employee is engaged in that plan and it's, you know, when they're ready. Um, but have those practices in place now. Don't wait until you have an employee who tells you, you know, I'm beginning my gender affirmation, I'm starting hormone therapy, uh, and they're afraid of how you're going to respond to it. The organization should have a plan in place. If your organization offers health insurance, um, research options that cover people's gender affirming needs, because a lot of health insurance, unfortunately, um, has exclusions for gender affirming care for, you know, it's always referred to with archaic gross terms like sex reassignment surgery and uh, psychosexual disorders and things that are wildly unaffirming. They did not attend this webinar when they wrote those. Um, but look for plans that, that cover all of your employees' uh, gender affirming needs. And then again, don't out employees to others without their consent. Don't try to be like you know, like the white savior, don't try to be the hetero or cisgender savior who goes and out them to everyone for their own benefit. Wait until they're ready, involve them in that decision. Okay, the last section we're gonna cover is how to assist uh, your transgender, nonconforming, non-binary, et cetera, clients with the name and gender marker change process. But I will pause quickly to see if there's any questions. Yes, definitely got people engaged in thinking. We have several questions that have come in. The first one is, what would be the best way to include the pronouns in the signature line like you suggested? Uh, she was asking if you should put pronouns and then list them, or preferred pronouns and list them, or just not use the word pronouns at all and just list the options there. So, um, let me, before I say anything, make sure that I'm correct in how mine are listed. So mine says, I don't know if you guys can see this. Um, wait, okay, there we go. Simone, Chris, blah, 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 blah. Pronouns, she, her, hers. Can we all see that? Um, so that's what I suggest. That's what a lot of um, trans attorneys and advocates that I work with, how they've done it, and I've followed their lead. Um, but yeah, after your name and your, your title or whatever, just pronouns, dot, dot, she, her, hers, they, them, theirs, he, him, his. It's a, a really good way to demonstrate inclusivity. Okay, next question. It can be uncomfortable to use some of these terms for fear of offending a person. What do you say to someone who avoids acknowledging another's gender identity? Is it safer to avoid asking someone how they identify or asking what pronouns they prefer? Or do you suggest addressing it head on? That is an excellent question. And uh, I don't, you know, I don't think there's a right and a wrong or that this is black and white. Um, in my practice, I, like I said, I introduce myself using my pronouns. And if that person wants to and feels comfortable disclosing their pronouns, which most often they do, um, great. If not, I, I think that's a good question. Would I necessarily say, what pronouns do you want me to use? Um, I think that if you're using the pronouns that you assume they use and they haven't told you otherwise, um, you know, you're, you're, you're probably fine but yeah you don't want to push too hard if the person is not comfortable disclosing that so you know the most you can do is just continue using yours and uh make it very clear that it's an affirming and welcoming environment um and a non-discriminatory environment and hopefully they will get to the point where they're comfortable to share that all right perfect the next question is very interesting because it addresses office culture. Uh, this person said, my office requires us to call people Mr. or Mrs. Smith. What would the appropriate title be for someone whose pronoun is they? <sighs> so, um, <laughs> obviously not Mr. or Mrs. Um, I, I have a client who is, um, he, they, he uses he, him, and they, them pronouns, but they are intersex. They were born um, with X, neither XX nor XY um, chromosomes, and genetically, biologically, they are neither male nor female. And they taught me that they use the, they use MX period instead of MR or MS. 
Um, but I don't know how you would say that. You can't say, I, I honestly, I don't know. I think that best, the best practice is don't use Mr. and Mrs. unless the person has told you I identify with, I identify as a male or I identify as a female. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that bringing back to your organization and, and tackling some of those policies that seem inevitable and seem like, well, this is how it's always been. You know, we're in the legal field. It has to be professional. We have to use Mr. and Mrs. We really don't. And if you can get to the root of why it's so important to get rid of some of those gendered stereotypical things, um, it really does create a much more welcoming environment for everyone. Um, but that's a great question with they, them, people who use they, them pronouns. I wouldn't use Mr. or Mrs., but I also don't know that I have another suggestion. Using a person's name is always good. I mean, when in doubt, just use their name. Sorry, I don't have a better answer. No, that's a perfect answer. And we have one last question. If someone's pronoun is she, isn't it obvious that the other pronouns would be her and hers? Are there people who would use pronouns she, him, their, i.e. mixing it up? That's another good question that I've actually never been asked. Um, I guess, yeah, you could just do pronoun dot dot she if you feel more comfortable. Um, kind of the norm and, and what I see among all of my uh, colleagues who work with LGBT folks is to have she, her, hers, he, him, his, they, them, theirs. But, you know, I think that if, if you want to do pronoun she, that's still affirming and wonderful. And, and I don't think there's any reason you need all three. All right, I think that's it for now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Great questions, guys. See, guys, that's a, a gendered term right there. Great questions, everyone. Um, all right, so name and gender marker changes. Um, just real quick, I, I told you guys, I told you all, look at me, way back in the beginning that, you know, two thirds of trans individuals have not updated their name and gender marker on their identification documents to reflect who they truly are. And I said there were a lot of obstacles and barriers. And I want to get in a little bit more into to what those are and how we tackle them. So to do a legal name change, um, you have to file a petition and all of these accompanying forms, a civil cover sheet, a notice of related cases, uh, all of these forms, um, which we as lawyers, it, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. They're pro se forms, it's easy. But I've had clients who got stuck on the first question. The first thing on there is petitioner. That's not a common sense term that everyone would know what it means. Um, and to know that petitioner not only means you, the person petitioning the court, but also that it means your dead name. You know, many people think, oh, do I put my, my new name that I'm changing it to or my old name? So um, just the, filling out the first question on the form is, is difficult. And then when you combine that with, you know, limited functional literacy or limited access to resources, to be able to even find the petition online or to be able to get to the courthouse to get the, the forms, things like that. There's so many barriers. So then um, you, you fill out all the forms. There's a $400 filing fee and courts don't tell clients that that fee can be waived. There's an application for indigent status. I'm sure everyone knows this. I'm preaching to the choir. But um, if you go on these courts websites and look up the name change forms, they don't Put it out there that there's a way to waive this $400 fee. So I work with clients every day who have waited years to have their authentic identity affirmed and to be able to apply for jobs without fear of discrimination and apply for housing and, and just go get a drink at a bar, anything, um, because they didn't have the $400 to pay the filing fee. And so it's really important that we let clients know that they can have that fee waived. Um, I'm going to talk about Florida Name Change, the resource that we developed um, and it includes all of these forms, but anyway, bunch of forms, $400 filing fee, then you have to get fingerprinted for a background check, which is not only costs money and requires transportation, but also so many of my clients are afraid that, you know, some little event in their, in their history, some criminal history from when they were a juvenile or, or, you know, from, from any time is going to preclude them from getting their name changed. So they're afraid to even try. And the reality is, unless you've had a felony conviction and you've had your civil rights revoked and they have not been restored, um, you can get a name change and a judge should not deny a name change because of um, criminal history outside of felony convictions. Um, but 
again, that information, you know, is not widely uh, known and many people fear the process because of that, then you have to request a hearing from the court and appear before a judge. Now, not every county requires the hearing in front of the judge. Um, some counties either don't have a hearing or right now they're over the phone, but regardless, appearing in court to out yourself as transgender, that is a huge barrier. And I have so many clients that that's that they might've had the money and they might've been able to fill out the forms, but they don't want to show up in court and out themselves and in front of everyone as trans. And so it's important that we give clients all the resources and, and knowledge. So they don't have to out themselves in court. They can say, I could go change my name tomorrow from Simone to Michelle because I feel like it, because I don't like the name Simone. I did consider that for a while. Um, but I could do that. There's no, there's no requirement that you have to, you know, there's only certain reasons why you can change your name. So a trans person can just say, this is the name that I identify with. This is the name that I like. This is what people call me. Um, you can change your name for any reason other than like, I'm running from the FBI and trying to get out of debt. So I'm changing my identity. Um, but again, all of these are obstacles and, and things that are very scary when approaching this process. And while we view it as like a clinical, like legal pro se filing of forms and a hearing and it's blah, 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 this can be the most important and affirming moment in a trans individual's life. I have to tell you, in, in the almost four years I've been practicing law, the best, some of the best days of my career have been going with clients to their name change hearing who were afraid, who, who, you know, just wanted a little support and watching them get that piece of paper afterwards that finally affirms who they are and who they've always known themselves to be. And they don't have to explain it anymore. They have this document that will allow them to change their, their identification documents and just live their life authentically. Um, so we think, okay, this whole process, the name change process, it's crazy, it's hard, it's expensive, there's so much required, that must be the end, right? No. So after they get the court order for name change, they then have to use that court order to update their social security, driver's license, passport, birth certificate, etc. And in order to change their gender marker so that they don't have a name and a gender marker that, you know, don't match, um, they need a doctor's letter showing that they've had appropriate clinical treatment for gender transition. Seems easy enough, right? That's because most of us have healthcare and we have access to doctors and we have a car so we can get to and from the appointment. We, you know, th there's all these things we take for granted that many people, the idea of even finding a doctor that does gender affirming care, who then is knowledgeable enough to write the letter to say they've undergone appropriate clinical treatment for gender transition. Um, even just that is, is an, an, a burden and an obstacle that many people can't surpass. Um, and then, to update the name and gender marker on each document, you have to take the court order and the, the doctor's letter to the social security office. And, and sometimes you're faced with bigotry and transphobia. And um, you know I, I've had to call social security office more than once um, to say you had a, a clerk that was really, really horrible to my client. Um, then uh, the DMV, same thing. I just got, got done working with the DMV yesterday on an individual who they uh, were not allowing him to update his gender marker despite him doing everything right. Um, the point is, it takes a lot on behalf of, of this person who is going through this process and understanding everything that they have to go through just to get documents that reflect who they are um, is, is really important for us to know and important if we're trying to help them with this. Um, so after spending a year doing name change clinics all over the state and um, trying to help one individual at a time um, or groups of individuals on Saturdays doing clinics, I'm sure I've done clinics with, with many of you who are watching this, um, I realized there's no way I'm gonna reach every trans person in the state who desperately needs access to this service and access to justice, access to the court system, access to this, the, the name change process. So uh, we created this website called Florida Name Change and it walks you through every single step. Um, you can use it with your clients or you can just refer clients to it. Um, the first step is the petition to change your legal name. And then it walks you through social security, driver's license, passport, birth certificate, et cetera. The point is to make things easier for folks, kind of like TurboTax. I know that's copyrighted. I'm not supposed to say that, but it's like, it makes a complicated situation much more simple and easily digestible and provides step-by-step -step guidance. 
So um, just so we know, uh, if you're working with minors, the minor has to have an adult uh, who's over the age of 18 to petition the court on their behalf for a legal name change, and it has to be a parent or guardian. Um, you can imagine why this is difficult for some youth who do not have affirming parents, who do not have a supportive adult in their life who's willing to, to do this for them, which is why it's so important that those of us who are representing youth, whether it's in the dependency system, in the education system, in the delinquency system, um, understand that not all kids have access to a legal name and gender marker change. So we need to be their advocates and use other things other than just the legal name change process to ensure that they're affirmed across the board. So, you know, at school using, like I said, the IDEA and Section 504, arguing Title IX, um, FERPA, the, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, using these other tools to ensure that youth are affirmed for their gender identity because, like I said, many of them don't have access to this legal name change process. Um, all right, off my kid's soapbox now. Um, but the, sorry, I brought that up because there's a different process for adults versus minors. So we have all the forms for if you're over 18 and all the forms for if you're under 18 and it's your parent petitioning on your behalf. Um, we have county resources where it lists every single county in the state. Um, you can click on it and find um, local uh, uh, resources um, that, that you, uh, attorneys that you can get into contact with. You can find out how much the filing fee is, how much the fingerprinting fee is, all of that stuff. It provides the exact address of where to file your petition, how to find the courthouse, the phone number, um, each of the sheriff's offices or fingerprinting agencies. Um, every single piece of information a person might need should be on this website. And if it's not, please let me know. Um, and if you'd like to be listed as a resource, um, in your county, please let me know and I'm happy to, to include you on the website. So what it does is you can download a blank one and just fill it out yourself. But the reason that we have it auto populate and generate the forms is because again, petitioner does not tell the person what that means. So we ask, what's your current legal name? Um, so uh, what's your current legal name? What name are you changing it to? Um, you know, questions that are common sense and easy to answer, and it takes you automatically from one to the next. So, you know, most folks don't know what judicial circuit they live in. Um, you click on the county you live in and it auto populates the judicial circuit, things like that, that make it easier. So when you're done, um, you email the completed form to yourself. And what's cool is let's say, you know, there's a lot of forms. Let's say that you get two or three done and then you have a life, situation and, and you, you can't continue the process. And so you come back to it later and you don't remember where you left off. In your email, there's a link that says click here and it will automatically remember whether it's a month later, a year later, it will remember exactly where you were in the process and it'll take you right back there. Um, so it pops up in your inbox, filled out, ready to go, um, ready to be filed and uh, really simplifies the process. Um, then it helps you fill out, the website has the ability to help you fill out your um, social security application uh, to amend your name and gender marker, your birth certificate application to name your uh, amend your name and gender marker, all of those things. Um, and it, like I said, auto-populates, you pick how many copies you want, you email it to yourself, and it shows up right there in your inbox, totally filled out and ready to go. Um, I have a really good working relationship with the general counsel of the Department of Vital Statistics. Um, because I've had to do a lot of advocacy on behalf of particularly trans youth who they were, um, they needed some help in, in learning how to affirm and, and, and correctly update identification documents and birth certificates. Um, I also have a good working relationship with the folks at the DHSMB um, and, and they've been great in kind of moving along their, their processes and practices to affirm all people. So if anyone's working with clients who are experiencing discrimination when it comes to name and gender marker, um, and, and identification documents, please, please let me know. Um, really trying to have the website include everything a person could need. Um, and, and no one, no one should be walking around with identification documents that out them to strangers and that disclose very intimate personal details that, that put them at risk of, of harm, genuine harm, um, just because they don't have access to this court process. Um, so, please uh, refer your clients to Florida Name Change or use it with them. Um, and if there's any, any issues you find, any, any troubleshooting you need, I am always here and always happy to help work through these issues with folks. Um, so thank you.
Does anyone have any questions at this point? Thank you for the fantastic training. We've had a couple suggestions come through. Eric Hughes suggested a website about pronouns that's helpful to link to in your email signature. Okay. It's mypronouns.org for anyone who can't see the chat. Awesome. Hi, Eric. And I wanted to let everybody know that the Florida Bar just notified me that it, this has been approved for CLE credit. So that excellent news. Oh. The CLE number is 4052 and it's been approved for 2.5 general CLEs and 2.5 bias elimination CLEs. So that takes care of half of your professional responsibility requirements. So thank you so much Simone for putting the presentation on. It's, it's been wonderful. Let me see if we had any new questions come in. I also just wanted to um, let everyone know, like I said, uh, I'm going to send this presentation to Christy and she can circulate it to everyone who registered, but please don't hesitate to contact me um, when it comes to any, any questions you have about implementing any of the policies or practices we discussed. Um, I have lots of sample, like, like I said, intake forms and ideas about bathroom inclusion and, and all sorts of things like that. So, if you need resources, if you if you want any guidance, please reach out to me. If you have clients that are LGBTQ who are facing discrimination or who need assistance, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, it's it's been really nice talking to you all. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned getting flag stickers and lapel pins. Where would people find those? I mean, I have honestly just gotten them on Amazon. Um, you know, it, it, it's they're pretty easy to find, but I know there are organizations um, like the Human Rights Campaign, the National uh, Center for Trans Equality, Equality Florida, um, the National Center for Lesbian Rights. There's lots of organizations like that that are doing really incredible work and that also sell these types of um, affirming, inclusive uh, stickers and buttons and bumper stickers and things like that. And so, you know, getting them from an organization that's doing this work and really engaged with the community is ideal. Um, but I'm happy to send around uh, some websites and such where you can get stuff like that. I know it uh, in schools, there's these really amazing safe place stickers that teachers, I know in Orange County, they're, they're widely, widely used, but um, you like put a sticker on your door that says safe space or safe place and it's uh, a rainbow. And it just lets students know like, this is gonna be an affirming okay place to, to exist. Um, and so, you know, we can do the same thing in our offices or on our bodies or, or however we can demonstrate inclusivity. Okay, wonderful. And Jen Broomfield sent a suggestion of a website, transveteran.org, that has a guide for veterans seeking to change their DD-214 discharge documents, which reminds me that Jen and I will be putting on a short webinar tomorrow it's really a basic introduction geared towards veterans themselves um, who were possibly discharged under don't ask, don't tell or prior policies to help them get discharge upgrades. So that'll be at 3.30 tomorrow on Facebook Live. You can find it on the Bay Area Legal Services Facebook page, the link to that. Uh, lots of compliments. Thank you so much for a great presentation. And I also want to thank the public interest law section of the Florida Bar and especially Cabrillo Banner for helping get the CLE approved so quickly so that we could get this webinar in during Pride Month to celebrate with all of you. And thank you so, so much to Simone and Southern Legal Counsel for sharing all this information with us. Thank you for hosting it. This was great. And again, feel free to reach out to me with any questions, guys. Thank you. All right, I don't see any more questions, just lots of compliments. So, How do I, I will see compliments. Where are they? Lots of compliments. I you. Awesome. Uh, thank you. So, it looks like everyone really enjoyed the presentation, and, and I so appreciate you sharing this with a statewide audience. I know you are super busy, and I really appreciate you taking two hours to educate us. Of course, it was my pleasure. Thank you so much for doing this. All right, take care, everyone. Bye bye. bye.